Thank you again for joining us today for our webinar uh, sponsored by Texas Instruments and presented by Texas Instruments, Wide VN DC-DC Converters, <clears throat> Reliable Power for Demanding Applications. Again, I'm Mary Gannon, Senior Editor with Design World, and your presenter today is uh, Jim McDonald. Um, before we begin the webinar, I'd like to remind you that this webinar will be available afterwards and via email at www.designworldonline.com. There will be a Q&A at the end of the presentation, so please stay on board, and if you have any important questions, you can answer them, ask them at the end. And also, uh, if you're on Twitter, please uh, know that the hashtag for this webinar is pound DW webinar. <clears throat> Uh, your presenter today is Jim McDonald, uh, the Marketing Director for Texas Instruments Power Products Division, whose focus is on developing wide input voltage power conversion ICs that help customers develop more robust, more flexible power converter designs for automotive, industrial, and communications equipment power from high voltage DC supplies. Jim has more than 19 years of experience in product marketing and applications engineering at analog, mixed signal semiconductor and power supply companies and holds a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the University of Arizona. I'm going to turn it over to you now, Jim, and we can begin. Thanks, Mary. Appreciate it. Um, welcome, Thank everybody, you. to the webinar. Um, so again, our title today is YVN DC to DC Converters. And Getting started, we're going to start off by talking about what is YVM and give a little overview. And then we're going to go into some of the system challenges associated with designing power for a few different types of systems. And then we'll finish off by talking about some of the design tools uh, that we have uh, to help you get started with your next design. So um, PI offers a wide, uh, wide VM products offer reliable solutions for some of the most demanding applications. And the top three that we typically encounter here are industrial, automotive, and communications. Um, primarily because all of these applications require input voltages that can exceed 30 volts. Um, and you'll see some of those on the left. Some of the power challenges associated with these designs are that the input voltage can vary over a very wide range. Um, or you could have two different input sources, a primary and a backup, and those may be different. Um, last but not least, um, these tend to be fairly harsh and or noisy environments where you can experience large transients. So you have to be careful how you design your power supply. PI offers a wide range of devices uh, including controllers, integrated set converters, and complete power modules for buck, boost, and buck boost applications. So one of the main benefits of YV and DC to DC power is that they're optimized for use across a, a wide range of applications because of their input voltage range. What you're seeing here is uh, are the three different markets we talked about and some sub-segments or different types of equipment within each market. And what you'll see is there's a wide range of input voltage buses. However, um, it's important to note that this is not where the, the actual operating range is. Each of, the, each of these buses has a range that can span a much wider uh, uh, voltage range. And furthermore, uh, there can be transient conditions that can require you to operate up to a much higher voltage, up to 60 and sometimes 100 volts, as well as down well below 10 volts. So that's a pretty wide range, and it offers a couple of different challenges. Um, so we have a number of different devices that can operate at 40 volts and 60 volts for the automotive and industrial and then 75 and 100 volt products that will address the most challenging applications like communications. One of the other benefits of YVN is that it can actually help us reduce the amount of protection and save PCB area for the functions that you're trying to design your equipment to do. Um, this is a comparison of some of the different ways you can handle a wide input voltage. And on the left is a transient absorption device that can protect the power supply during uh, transient conditions. So 
So it has a pro of uh, it doesn't interrupt the power flow when you occur when the transient occurs. The challenges can be is it's tough to maybe select a vice that sometimes because it depends on the voltage, the energy, and the time that it has to withstand that transient. And the longer the time and the higher the energy, the bigger that device can be. So it may not always be feasible within a reasonable size or cost. In the middle is a disconnect set, uh, which is another method of handling transients. And the benefit of this is it can be pretty small because it doesn't dissipate the power, it doesn't absorb power, and it, which means it can survive for a longer time. The challenge is that it, it looks like it has multiple components, um, and if you can get a integrated device, it may actually add considerable cost to the design. The other downside is that it creates a voltage drop, and therefore it'll reduce your overall system efficiency. And last but not least, and this is an important one, it actually interrupts the power flow during a transient. So you must in order to use this, you must be able to turn off the equipment, and that's not always desirable. On the right is where you can really simplify your device uh, by using a YD and DC to DC solution. Um, this part, depending on the voltage range that you, uh, that you pick, can operate through the entire transient without interrupting power flow. It doesn't require any other components for design work. Um, so it's for simple use and it requires a minimum of PCB area. If there's a con, it would be that 3.3 volt, they may not be as efficient as maybe some other choices that you can pick. So um, it comes down to just picking the right device that will operate over your complete design range. So let's look at some of the systems that this, uh, this kind of power supply is used for. And the first one is industrial. And one of the biggest system challenges in industrial is designing a reliable system bias supply that is also small, low cost, and easy to design. In industrial equipment and in most equipment, there's usually a host microcontroller that is used to uh, systemically bring up the entire system. But in order for it to do that, it has to have power uh, right away. So this is the first device to be powered and then it then brings up the main power. So it needs to be reliable, it needs to turn on the same way every time. Some of the application challenges with this bias rail is that number one, it has to be powered from a 24 volt rail and again that can experience transients up to 40 volts or even higher. In a lot of cases isolation is desirable either for noise immunity or for safety. And then once you have an isolated power supply, uh, you don't necessarily want to use opto-isolators because that's one of the least reliable components in the system, so it's often avoided. So this is a challenge that we need to get through. One of the, um, some of the applications where this is needed uh, include factory automation, like PLCs, and that's where you need multiple bias supplies to operate some uh, precision analog equipment and or a microcontroller. Uh, motor drive systems require uh, bias supplies of plus and minus voltages in order to drive the IGBT drivers, the bias, the IGBT drivers. And in the bottom, an isolated DC to DC module that uses a digital controller like the ECD3138 um, requires a little bit of bias in order to power up that chip before it can start activating the MOSFET and transferring power flow. So these are just a few of the scenarios where this is needed. And one of TI's solutions for this is the, uh, what's called a flybuck bias supply chip. And the LN5017 family is a, a group of six devices it operates all the way up to 100 volts, and it has three different current ratings uh, for 100 milliamps all the way up to 600 milliamps. So this is a great solution for any bus, bus voltage, up to about six watts of power. Um, and this uses synchronous internal FETs and a constant on-time architecture, so there's no external FETs and there's no loop compensation needed. So it's a pretty integrated design and it's very easy to design. It operates up to a megahertz, so the magnetics can be pretty small. 
and the constant on-time architecture delivers really fast transient response, which further reduces the output capacitance. And then the nice thing about this type of solution is that it does not require an opto-isolator. So it gives a little bit higher reliability and, again, fewer components. On the right side, what you're showing is that this device can operate in two different modes. It operates as a synchronous buck, um, where it's just a step-down converter. And then at the bottom right is a flybox circuit where it operates as a isolated bias supply. So let's look at what a flybox uh, is and how we use it. The so a flybox is generally uh, oh can I there we go the flybox name comes from a combination of a couple of things. Um, it's primarily a synchronous buck converter, as you can see down here on the bottom left. But we add a, an extra winding to the inductor to create an isolated output that's very similar to a flyback, and that's where we get the term flybuck. Um, on the right shows the complete flybuck circuit, and while this has only a single isolated output, you can easily add additional windings to the secondary and get multiple outputs. So this is a really simple and low part count solution for isolated and multi-output power supply bias designs. And you'll note that there's no optoisolator needed here. So a flybuck and a flyback is generally uh, compare, uh, uh, compared favorably in some of the same applications. So as a summary, um, the flybuck and flyback um, both can create multiple outputs that are isolated. So those are pretty similar. The flybuck has a disadvantage in that, or a limitation in that the minimum input voltage must always be greater than the output voltage or the primary side output voltage because it is primarily a synchronous buck. So a buck means it must step down. Um, the flyback can be used where the output can be higher or lower than the input, so that's one area where maybe a flybuck is not a great choice. The benefits really are that it's much smaller and uses a smaller transformer and fewer parts counts, so you can get into a smaller area. The transformer in a flybuck is a two-winding transformer versus three windings for a flyback, so it's a little less expensive and a little smaller. The FET that you use uh, doesn't have to hit as much, uh, doesn't have to observe as much stress in terms of voltage um, versus a flyback because it only needs to withstand VN and a flyback must handle VN plus the output voltage divided by the turns ratio on the transformer. And then from a performance perspective, you can really achieve similar, about 5% regulation on both you can get better regulation on the flyback using an opto-isolator, but again, that's going to increase your board size and your cost. So let's go into a case study so we can look at both uh, side by side. So what we did is we took an, a look at an industrial application where it's a 24 volt input and then dual plus or minus 12 volt outputs at 250 milliamps each. So as we said, the flybuck has a little simpler transformer. It is regulating on the primary side because it is primarily a synchronous buck. And so the 12 volt is on the primary and the minus 12 volt is on the secondary. On the flyback, we're using secondary side regulation and we have the extra winding because both of the outputs must be on the secondary. It doesn't necessarily uh, regulate a primary side voltage. So when you look at the PCB comparison, what you see, and, and it's important to note that both of these solutions have integrated sets, so that's not a disadvantage, but the flybuck ends up having about half the total PCB area and about half the components, so you can fit it in a much smaller space. Um, and looking at the performance comparison, again, these two circuits are 
operating at exactly the same operating frequency uh, or the uh, uh, operating current level. So both outputs are loaded in the same way. And what you'll see in the regulation is the fly buck can achieve uh, plus or minus 5% accuracy under a balanced load. That seems to work really well. The fly back actually gives you much better performance in the, the bulk of the load range. It does, however, have a limitation in that it, without a minimum load, it's going to degrade the regulation at very light load when it goes into discontinuous operation. Um, generally speaking, if you need about 5%, both of these solutions can work very well. From an efficiency standpoint, they're pretty well matched, although the fly buck has a little bit uh, better efficiency, a couple percent throughout the load range. So that's something that is noteworthy, but generally speaking, they're pretty similar. So the next challenge in uh, working with power and industrial equipment is designing a boost supply that has overload protection. Um, a lot of industrial equipment uses motors, and driving motors can be a challenge. It usually requires a higher output voltage, and the challenge with a boost converter is that it does not inherently have any overload or short circuit protection. So if you have a short circuit on the output, current will flow from the input to output, and you could bring down the main supply, and that's generally not uh, acceptable. So with a traditional boost solution shown here, what you would have is a hot swap or inrush controller at the input of the boost supply, and you may also have a fuse to handle uh, catastrophic faults. But this solution requires a lot more PCB area, uh, and both of these chips are active ICs, so there's some interaction between when the hot swap turns on and off and when the boost controller turns on and off. So you have to be careful in how you design them to interact correctly. Adding a, going to a boost controller with a disconnect switch allows you a much simpler solution because that disconnect switch actually in, limits the inrush current during the startup and during overload conditions. It eliminates the need for a hot swap and it will disconnect the load from the input during any kind of catastrophic fault. So it's going to avoid any unnecessary fuse replacements, and it may avoid the fuse altogether. And that, that really reduces the system cost and the footprint and can increase the reliability. So a few applications where boosts are needed to drive motors are a point of sale system where you're driving the print motor. Uh, an ATM machine where you're driving the motors that are uh, uh, producing the uh, currency and or receipts for your card. There's several motors in that. And then this is just another example, an industrial uh, injection molding machine where there's several motors uh, to move the material through the equipment. These are just a few of the examples where you need a boost and where you probably want to have the system continue working even if there's uh, a temporary fault in the motor. So how we solve that is with a synchronous controller, a boost controller that has a disconnect switch integrated. And the LN5121 is such a device. So it's a synchronous boost controller with both switches, um, and then it uses a disconnect switch on the input um, to incorporate the hot swap functionality. Um, it uses a sense resistor, and this is important because it does double duty. The sense resistor it senses current for the inrush control, but it also acts as a sense resistor for the boost controller. So versus a hot swap plus boost where you might need two sense resistors, this one only needs one and you're reducing the power losses. It's synchronous so it, uh, it provides very good efficiency. And then that load disconnect set performs four functions. Number one, it disconnects the load. Um, when there's a fault or when you turn it off so that you can drain less power from the input, which may be a battery. Number two, it, it controls inrush current. So um, you, don't have to, you don't have large spikes of current coming from the input supply. It also incorporates overcurrent protection with hiccup uh, restart so that uh, during a temporary fault, it will ride through it and restart automatically. 
And then for a catastrophic fault, uh, it'll disconnect the load completely from the input, act as a circuit breaker, so it protects the rest of the system from going down. And as you can see, the, the arrangement of the FETs means that during a fault condition, during an output current fault, no current will flow from input to output. And the arrangement of this FET in the boost supply means that if the output is pulled up accidentally, there will be no current flow from the output back down to ground. Okay, so there are a couple fault conditions that occur. And then this is a picture of the LM5121 eval board that has the input disconnect FET included. Now the circuit protection, uh, the circuit breaker protection um, is rather nice because it automatically, it works all, all the time. It senses the current across that sense resistor and then when that, the voltage across, a, uh, across the two nodes exceeds the 160 millivolt threshold, this comparator will work to turn off the disconnect. The, the disconnect set and remove the load from the source. Now this current sense amplifier continues to sense the voltage across it and when that voltage drops below the disable threshold, you can turn that set back on again and it'll go through a, a soft start, a restart, and if the fault is still there, it'll disconnect again. You can also program it to stay off so that it doesn't continue to try to keep operating. That's, a fault, that's a, an option that the user has that they can use. So the next challenge we want to talk about is uh, achieving high power density and low EMI. Um, most systems end function is not to provide power. So um, oftentimes there's not much space on the board left to handle the power supply function, but yet it's a critical function that needs to be, needs to be provided. So um, you have a number of choices, and one of them is a discrete power IC, but in that case you have a lot of external components that you might have to deal with, and it may be a little bit more complex to design and debug, but the main thing is it's going to probably take a little bit more space on the board. You could pick a integrated DC to DC module which is great because it's very small, um, but as you can see down here, some of the module options available on the market uh, can be challenging to manufacture because they may have signal path traces that are buried underneath and are not on the peripheral of the package, and those can be challenging to get to to make sure you've got good solder adhesion. And another challenge is that in general, all power circuits generate EMI that can disrupt uh, the performance of any sensitive system signals. And even in these power modules, sometimes they can use air core inductors that will radiate EMI above and below. So you have to be careful where you're placing your power supply or it may intrude upon any kind of signals that you're generating on the board. Um, TI's LMZ power modules um, help really simplify the design and give you high density, but they also provide excellent performance and low EMI. So the LMZ 1 and 2 modules are um, very simple to use. It's a single exposed pad and it has physical IC leads, so it's very, very easy to prototype and manufacture. These modules offer pin compatible upgrades from uh, 1 amps all the way up to 10 amps uh, using the same footprint. They are all web bench enabled, which means you can pick the right part, simulate your part, do the thermal analysis, and you can edit it, and then you can uh, create the bill of materials, and in some cases you can even build uh, the end module using one of our partners like DigiKey uh, all at once. From a performance perspective, these are super integrated, so you only need as few as five external components. So it's really very high density, and these provide current up to 10 amps. So you can provide a lot of power in a small space. Because of the shielded inductor that's used inside here, they also generate really low EMI. So it meets some of the most critical uh, EMI standards as shown here. And because of this large exposed pad, 
they deliver very, very nice thermal performance. So they'll operate up to the maximum operating range or uh, maximum temperature range of 85C in some cases without any airflow or heat sink required. So very nice uh, high performance modules, very easy to use. And then for uh, the next system that we're going to talk about is automotive systems. So the first challenge we have to talk about is dealing with the automotive battery range. Um, the key to designing uh, power for automotive is making sure that you can handle the entire range of the battery. Um, and this battery voltage could be as high as 40 volts or 60 volts during load dump or due to uh, transients. Um, or in cranking conditions, it co could go below 5 volts and maybe as low as 3 volts in some cases. So you really have to be able to operate over a very wide load range. And YDN chips are generally required in this application and can really help you reduce the component count due to transients. Now you just you do need to pick the right IC though. So a typical automotive power system has a number of different devices. It starts with a protection circuit here, and that can sometimes it's optional, but generally there's some kind of a reverse voltage protection and or an overcurrent protection block here. And then over on the right, there is a wide VN converter. It's usually a buck converter that takes the, the output of the protection block and then drops it down to a lower voltages where you can use low voltage standard uh, VN devices to create the rest of the power rails in the system. Now, there's a battery condition block here that is sometimes used to make sure that during a cold crank condition, that you can maintain a minimum voltage before the buck converter to make sure that any of the downstream equipment does not stop working when you're cranking it. Um, and this is sometimes optional. It just depends on whether you need to make sure that the equipment continues to operate through that cold crank situation or whether it's okay if it stops operating momentarily. So that brings us to our challenge, which is how do we maintain operation on that downstream power system during a start-stop event? Um, so there's a new market need that says that automotive manufacturers are starting to add what we call idle start-stop capability in order to increase the fuel efficiency. And it's expected that at least 15 million vehicles will have this capability by next year. And what this means is um, when you, this is called a mild hybrid type of a vehicle, and when it comes up to a stop, the engine will actually turn off. And when you, uh, the, the light turns green, you hit the gas pedal, and it will look very similar to a warm crank condition, which means that the input voltage could go down to as low as 3 volts. Now, normally when you're cranking your uh, vehicle ignition, it, your radio will drop out and maybe your navigation system will not work, but that's usually not a problem because you're just starting it at the beginning of your journey. Uh, imagine if you are coming up to a light and at every light your radio would go out and the video screen that your child is watching in the back seat would go out. That would probably get old after a while. So most of the new vehicles are including this voltage stabilizer module uh, in order to make sure that the voltage going to the downstream subsystem is at least on the order of 10 volts just to make sure that that equipment continues to operate throughout that start-stop event. Now, that this requires a boost controller or a boost converter. And one of the challenges is it needs to be scalable over a wide range of power levels because that subsystem could be less than 50 watts for a small one, all the way up to 400 watts for a larger system, or even higher if the vehicle manufacturer wants to make a centralized voltage stabilizer that supplies power to the entire vehicle. So there's a wide range of choices in how to implement that, um, which means you need a scalable uh, solution. 
and it should be small as possible. You really don't want to add significant size or weight to the vehicle um, because weight is going to take away from that fuel efficiency that you're trying to gain. So how we deal with that is with a boost controller, as we mentioned. And the LM5122 is a stackable boost controller that offers that scalability so that we can uh, span designs from less than 100 watts all the way up to maybe even a kilowatt. Um, so this is a device that operates up to 65 volt input, and it operates down a 4.5 volt input, but the important thing is it'll operate all the way down to 3 volts after it's been started up and powered, which means that it'll work over the load dump and the start-stop range. It is synchronous, so it's high efficiency. It is stackable with current sharing, and that's shown over here with a few simple connections. You can achieve current sharing. You can achieve uh, clock interfacing, uh, which means that one phase will be operating at 180 degrees out of phase with the other, and that will save you input capacitance. And it will share current very well. So you can stack these uh, building blocks on top of each other up to eight or more phases. The other thing that's nice is it has 100% duty cycle operation on the synchronous set, which means when you're not using the boost, it will minimize the amount of dropout or power loss through this circuit. So it looks almost benign and it's not in use. And then the other benefit is it has very low shutdown current, so it's not going to drain the battery when it's not in use. Shown at the bottom is a couple of circuits that we developed. Uh, the top one is our single phase reference design or eval module for up to 100 watts. And at the bottom, and this is not the scale, uh, is a four-phase reference design that's, that's intended for a 450-watt design. And both of these are available at links on ti.com if you want more information. And then the third challenge is trying to fit power into a tight space. Um, the amount of electronics in automobiles today is increasing rapidly. So Again, there's less and less space available for power. And there's a market need, again, saying that all automobiles produced in May of 2018 or beyond must have a rear view camera system in order to increase safety. Um, we've seen some events here and where most of the vehicle manufacturers are already implementing this on the high-end vehicles. We're going to see them in all vehicles in uh, several years. So the challenge is, as you can see in these pictures, that camera has to fit in a pretty tight little area. It still has to operate off the battery range, which means 4.5 up to as high as 42 volts operating. And it has to be high efficiency because it's in a tiny little size, and this is the external area of the vehicle, so it has to be exposed to external temperatures. So it's a, an extreme thermal environment. And then a couple other needs is it should not interfere with the radio band. Uh, the AM radio band goes up to 1.6 megahertz, and it should be far enough above that so it doesn't interfere with your radio quality. And last but not least, you want the best video quality signal you can get. So you should have a low EMI system so it doesn't degrade that quality of the image. So, one of the solutions we use to solve that is shown here. Um, it's the LM34919C. And this part is unique because it's number one, it comes in a package that is less than two by two millimeters, so it's super tiny. Um, it operates over the entire battery range. It has a constant on time topology, so it requires very, very little con uh, components. It doesn't require any compensation, so it's super easy to design. And then it operates above the AM band, so it's going to have, uh, it's not going to interfere with the AM radio, and it has low EMI, so it meets the CISPR 25 class 5 requirement, so it's not going to intrude on the, uh, um, the quality of the image. And on the right, um, and part of this image is cut off, I apologize for that, is a TI design that shows a complete camera system. Uh, including the complete power supply, 
Um, the, app, the image sensor, which is done by an Aptina image sensor, uh, as well as the transmission devices to transmit the signal back up the cable to the video screen in the head end of the vehicle. And this design is a complete reference design available online, including schematics, bill materials, and the Gerber files in case you wanted to build something of your own. And then the last uh, application we want to talk about is communication systems. And communication systems um, generally has the harshest environment because it operates from the highest bus voltage, typically 48 volts. But this voltage could go as high as 75 volts in operation or as high as 100 volts with transients. So that's a pretty challenging environment. Typically what happens is you'll, customers will use an isolated power module here to, trans, to uh, convert the 48 volts down to 12 volts, and then they'll use the 12 volts to convert down to any point of load voltages from there. And this, uh, this is typically used, but this requires two power conversion stages in series, so you're going to have to multiply the efficiencies of the two and you'll have to live with what you get. Um, generally speaking, in some cases, this 48 volt input may already be isolated through uh, a power supply, and as long as it doesn't go about 60 volts, you can use a non-isolated buck to convert that down to a lower voltage. Um, in some cases, you need to handle very low duty cycle ratios, which means that the, the V out is much, much less than the V in. And that can be a challenge that we'll talk about. Um, generally speaking, in um, communications equipment, constant frequency is desired for minimizing or managing the switching noise. And then transient response can be important to decrease the amount of capacitance. And then obviously you want to be stable over all operating ranges so that that equipment continues to operate throughout any kind of condition. So it's important that we select the right uh, converter for the application. Um, what we're going to talk about is four different types of uh, switching schemes. And we'll start at the bottom left with a constant on time or a decap. And these are two different names for the types of devices that we offer um, for this. This is very nice and easy uh, for a low duty cycle application, which is where the v, you know, output voltage is much, much lower than the input. It's also very flexible. Because um, it's easy to use, it doesn't have loop compensation required, so you don't have to tune it for different voltages. Uh, it has very fast transient response, so again, it's going to minimize your capacitance. A couple of the trade-offs, though. Um, it's good for up to about 5 amps, maybe a little more, but it's generally not going to get you to 10 or 20 amps, so it's got some limitations. It is not inherently constant frequency, so it's not synchronizable, so, uh, and it does require some voltage ripple to regulate well. So it may not be ideal for uh, sensitive radio or RF systems. Moving up here to voltage mode, this is going to give us a lot better frequency uh, uh, components because it, it is fixed frequency. It, it can be synchronized. It's got very good regulation and noise margin. Um, it is very tunable, so it, you can tune it and optimize it for a number of different application scenarios. However, it does require a little bit tougher compensation scheme, so there's a little bit of a trade-off there. And then another trade-off is if you need to create a much higher current rating than any one converter can do, in order to parallel these for higher current, you need to have additional current sharing circuitry to wrap around it so that it'll do that job well. Uh, it's important to note that voltage mode can be used both in low duty cycle and high duty cycle applications. So it is very flexible and can be used across the left side. Going from left to right, we start getting into some current mode topologies that generally give you better stability 
a faster transient response and offer current sharing because they are regulating current. Um, so they are a little bit more appropriate for when you want parallel devices for higher current. At the top is what we use as a peak current mode topology, which has inherent feed forward, just like that voltage mode on the left. So it will compensate for any changes on the input. It has a little bit simpler loop compensation scheme than voltage mode, so a little easier to compensate. A couple of the trade-offs are it's, it's really not as appropriate for high input voltage, low output voltage, because the current signal that it's sampling in order to maintain regulation is sampled when the top the high side set is on, and in a low, a high duty, or a, in a low duty cycle application, that time is very short, and there's a big current spike that you have to be able to ignore. So when you have a very low duty cycle application, you may not be able to use this, but it is very good for um, when VN is a reasonable percentage of V out, maybe 20% or more. Now. At the bottom right is the emulated current mode, and this is you know, almost the reverse of the peak current mode in that this topology senses the current signal during the off time of the high side set, which means that for high input voltage, low output voltage, you have plenty of time to sample that current signal, so it's really better used in low duty cycle applications. Other than that, it really has most of the same benefits as the peak current mode. The challenge on emulated current mode is exactly the opposite. When the output voltage gets really close to the input voltage, or when you're trying to drive very high frequencies, you might not have enough off time in order to regulate well, in order to sample that current signal. And uh, so this is just a, a, a few of TI's top YZM buck controllers. And as you can see, we've got a blend of all four of those different switching schemes. Um, the 40 volt and 60 volt devices are really appropriate for when you have a 24 volt rail. Um, the 60 volt devices are, are very good for when you have a 48 volt supply that is pretty well regulated or doesn't exceed 60 volts. But for telecom uh, uh, ranges where the input can vary, that's where the 75 volt and 100 volt devices are, are really best used. And what you'll see is the emulated current mode devices tend to be those that have the higher input voltages because those are really optimal for high input and low output. And this next chart shows uh, some of the TI NextFET sets that are ideal for YZN control applications. And a couple of these parts shown, um, the 60 volt pair, are really ideal for use with the YZN buck controllers on the previous slide. Um, and these can provide uh, excellent efficiency, some of the best in class. Um, we're getting efficiencies of 93% from a 24 volt input to a 5 volt output and 92% from a 36 volt input to 5 volt out. So these devices span anywhere from 40 volts all the way up to 100 volts. They're in industry standard 5 by 6 packages and they have very, very low uh, QG and QGD as well as low thermal resistance. So um, you know, low RDS on and low gate charge will allow you to switch at fairly fast switching frequencies with high efficiency in a pretty small space. And this shows uh, the TPS 40170 in that application with these TI next step there, and this shows you the efficiency that we were discussing. Um, you can see, you can go to BIPI.com for more detailed information on the new next step products for up to 100 volts, and there's a lot more information as well as videos that you can view there. And then the last challenge that we want to talk about is designing for low noise environments. Um, in 
systems that have RF circuits and VCOs, data converters, et cetera, where there's very sensitive signals being uh, communicated. This is where um, you really need to provide low noise power in order to achieve the kind of performance that that signal path device is intended to, to hit. And what you see here is uh, the power supply rejection of a DAC. And while it has very good rejection at low frequencies, in the red circle is where the switching noise from a power supply will actually intrude. And the power supply rejection is quite low at that frequency, which means that this DAC has a limited ability to filter out that switching noise from a power supply. So, uh, and then um, this is a wideband spectrum showing some of the power supply noise that can occur, and this can really interfere with RF signals. So designing a low noise supply it can be a challenge. So when you're looking for a linear regulator, which is sometimes used in these applications, there's a couple of specs you need to worry about. First is power supply rejection, which is the LDO's ability to reject that power supply noise. And the, the higher the value, the better it's going to attenuate that switching ripple from the input and prevent it from affecting the downstream device. Output noise is actually the noise generated from the LDL. So assuming a perfect input supply, how much noise would occur on the output? So in a few different scenarios where you might maybe want to pick a little bit of a different part. Uh, in the first scenario where maybe you have a higher than a 30 volt input, and you really don't like using switching regulators, you need some low noise, you've got a low current need, and you're really trying to minimize the size, uh, a YVN linear regulator may be a good choice. Assuming a fairly clean power supply feeding it, um, output noise should be some one of the, the specs that you look at, and it shouldn't be too high. Um, you may also want some power supply rejection. These two specs tend to go together. Um, you have to be careful that coming from a 30 volt input, um, you may need a heat sink because you may be dropping quite a bit of power and losing a bunch of efficiency across that device. So as the current goes up, you may want to rethink it. So that leads into the second example is where you need higher current, you really need a certain minimum efficiency, and you need low ripple. Um, so in this case, you might want to use the combination of a power supply, a DC to DC converter, followed by a linear regulator. And in this case, you're going to really want to focus on the power supply rejection, specifically at that switching frequency. Um, one thing to note is you do still want to minimize the dropout because you have high current. You may still need a heat sink if you can't minimize that dropout. And then third is where you're really dealing with very, very sensitive RF and radio signals, um, maybe low to medium current, uh, up to an amp. And we, this is where you really want to look for both low output noise and high PSRR, just to make sure that you're eliminating all of the noise from that sensitive signal. And this chart just shows a typical example of how we might do that combination of switching supply with linear regular output in order to optimize for efficiency and for noise. Um, in this case, the TPS 54060 is creating a bipolar output um, that then feeds a couple of linear regulators, one positive, one negative, that then feeds a piece of precision equipment, an A to D, an amplifier, or some other sensitive signal path instrument. And here, what we can see is that the ripple signal coming into the linear regulator is being attenuated by over an order of magnitude. So we're getting a really clean output that is free of power supply noise and it's free of uh, wideband noise because these two devices also have very low output noise. And this is a, uh, a, a, a small percentage of TI's overall YZN linear regulators. They span anywhere from 50 milliamps up to an amp or beyond, and they can operate all the way up to 60 or 100 volts. Now, you do have to be careful that you match the current and the voltage so uh, you're not dissipating too much power. And so if you have a low current wide VN need or a, or a system that can experience transients, 
and you really want to just keep it as quiet as possible, you can use a one of our higher voltage YGN LDOs. If you're just looking to remove power supply noise from a switching supply that's feeding it, you really need to focus on the parts with high power supply rejection ratio. And if you're really looking for best in class noise and ripple rejection, uh, parts with a low output noise are where you want to look. So these are just a few of the devices that are available, more are available on TI.com. And this just gives you, so, so that summarizes some of the challenges and solutions for addressing YZN power in automotive, industrial, and communications. These are just a few of, you know, the, the, the challenges that we face. Um, but TI does offer quite a wide range of tools that can help you address your specific design needs. Um, WebBench is super easy to select the right part using just VM, Vout, and IOUT. And it will let you select the part, edit it, simulate it, and in some cases, fit out the bill material and build it. Um, we have eval modules that are optimized for specific systems that can really help you get a sense of what you're going to see in your end performance. If you're just looking to learn about some of the new technology, we have videos that can help you. If you're already starting on a design and you need help from some of our power supply experts, our E2E &E community is a great place to start looking. And if you're designing a complete system and you really want to get a jump start, then TI Designs can really help you because these are complete system and subsystem reference designs that include schematics, bill of materials, Gerbers, and test reports in a lot of cases. So this is really, these tools can really get you started on your design. Again, the, uh, the power supply chips that we talked about here are just some of the choices that are offered by TI. To look at all the options that we have, as well as some of the tools we have to help you, um, go to www.ti.com slash YZN and you can see our complete offering. You can download our YZN white paper or the brochure and you can search for the right component for your design. So that's all I have for you today. Thanks very much for attending. And if anybody wants to discuss any challenges uh, that you have in your applications, feel, feel free to contact me at the email address that we'll provide later. Thanks very much. So now we'll start our Q&A. Hey, Jim, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry about that. I was on mute. Um, we have one question. It says, for the flybuck circuit, why is it that VN must always just be greater than V out? All right, thanks. Um, well, as I mentioned before, the flybuck is derived from a synchronous buck, and a synchronous buck is inherently a step-down converter. Um, so the way that the flybuck works is it regulates the primary side just like a synchronous buck converter would. So as long as the input voltage is greater than the primary side output voltage, it'll maintain good regulation. Now it's important to note that the secondary voltage can be higher or lower than the primary side input. So the secondary side can be designed in any way. It's just the primary that has to be uh, lower than the minimum input voltage. Okay, thank you, Jim. Uh, we have another one that came in. Said, uh, in an automotive application, what's the difference between a start-stop and a cranking condition? Okay, um, so the cranking condition and a start-stop condition really look the same. Um, from a voltage perspective in that it can drive the 
uh, the observed battery voltage as low as 3 volts. Um, the difference is the cranking condition generally doesn't always need the downstream equipment to continue to operate. Whereas in a start-stop event, as, uh, as I mentioned, um, you're going to want that audio-visual equipment, your navigation system, and your radio to, to continue to operate without any really annoying clicks, pops, or interruptions um, while you're, uh, uh, when you hit the gas and uh, uh, start to accelerate out of a stoplight. Okay, thank you, Jim. Um, and one more question we had come in says, why does constant on-time control have better transient response? Okay, that's a good question. Um, constant on-time is a very simple topology. Uh, it does not have an error amplifier, um, and it, it basically looks like a set of comparators. So when, the, when a transient occurs, it will force the output voltage to pull down uh, as a result, it will hit the comparator and it doesn't have to go through an error amplifier to start turning on the, the top side MOSFET and bring the voltage back up into regulation. So there's, there's a, a less delays in responding to that transient response. So it's a, it's a simple scheme. It doesn't provide constant frequency over the entire range, but it is very, very fast uh, in terms of transient. Okay, and I think that's all we have time for, Mary, if you want to take it uh, take it away. I will say that uh, if you guys submitted questions and we didn't get a chance to answer them, uh, I'll make sure, uh, Jim and I will make sure that we get back to you uh, within the day. Great. Uh, thank you, Jim and, and Kevin, and uh, thanks to all of our attendees for joining us today. This webinar will be available at our website at www.designworldonline.com if you missed any parts of it or wanted to check on more of the slides again. And all registered attendees will also receive an email with the link as well. Um, again, if you uh, uh, had anything that you wanted to share about what you learned today, uh, please tweet it out with the hashtag uh, uh, hash DW webinar. And you can always uh, connect with Design World on all of our social media channels there, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Google+, YouTube, Pinterest. Um, and uh, you're also welcome to discuss this on engineeringexchange.com. We thank you so much for joining us today, and uh, feel free to contact Jim and Kevin again if you have any questions. Thank you, Jim and uh, Texas Instruments, and goodbye. <laughs>